With a new day filled with adventure ahead, the party step out of the first spill tavern and follow in Zook's footsteps as he leads them to their first task in pursuit of fame, glory, and riches. Going to check on an old lady. But as soon as they get going, the party notice the half-orc that was keen to give chase to a rat yesterday seems to have spent the night sleeping in a dark and dirty alley. As the group steps in to investigate, they learn two things in quick succession. One, the half-orc isn't sleeping. And two, they just fell for the most obvious ambush in the book. Patrick appears to revel in the shocked faces of the party, until he realizes it's not his ambush that surprised them, but the fact that Patrick actually has friends. But as a hairy fight breaks out, the party learns that a mischief of were-rats is far more dangerous than a single one, even if that one has a combined ego of several, and the party finds themselves up against the wall. Just as things are looking especially grim for Nadar, the bronze dragonborn unleashes his lightning breath, which proves to be more shocking than a paladin actually succeeding their dick save. As the tides turn and Patrick attempts to flee with the remainder of his entourage, Dane decides taking a quick limb couldn't hurt. But as Patrick screams in pain and collapses, Dane concludes that he may have been wrong. Not having to worry about Patrick Wass and his were-rats lurking in the sewers anymore, Zook once again resumes the lead, and soon enough, they find themselves being invited inside for a cup of tea by Wendy, who appears to be recovering better than a fighter after a short rest. While Pornadar once again drinks alone and outside, just like my father does whenever his mother-in-law comes to visit, the two shorter members of the party enjoy a few minutes of idle conversation until Zook manages to get Wendy onto the topic of the Staff of Fire and determines just how powerful the very rare magic item really is. Just as soon as Zook and Wendy both notice Zook beginning to drool at the sight of it, the gnome wizard suddenly lunges forward to swipe the staff. However, as the old woman manages to keep it out of reach and prepares to defend herself from the sudden attack, Zook just barely, by the hair of his teeth, succeeds in using his own magic to put Wendy to sleep. Desperately snatching up the staff for himself, he urges Dane frantically to cut her head off before she awakens and takes her revenge on them. Overwhelmed by both shock and panic, still processing what just happened, Dane instinctively follows the gnome's commands, only to recognize the weight of what he's just done a moment too late. Meanwhile, Zook continues to demonstrate his sound decision-making skills today, and flees into the back garden where he lost a fight to a tree, and promptly sets the house on fire. The gnome, in an act of either genius or chaotic insanity, has now managed to both cover his evidential tracks and make Wendy Tuttle's death look like a terrible accident by the misuse of her own staff. With almost the entire village's halfling and gnome population rushing with buckets of water to hopefully save their poor elderly neighbor, Zook returned inside the now burning home to grab the traumatized dwarf and get him out the back of the house, managing to sift through the short crowd amongst the chaos and grabbing Nadar as they ran. Just as Zook thinks he's managed to get away with the Staff of Fire scot-free, he catches eye with a small halfling child looking dead at him through the crowd. Unable to tie up that loose end at the moment, however, Zook just continues to sprint away with the party back to the city walls of Briston. Far from any sense of safety yet, however, Zook brings a confused and distraught party back to the tavern to take up the offer of the caravan escort heading to the city of Dale ASAP. While Zook and Nadar spend the next hour with the wagon owner in the tavern, figuring out the details of just how quickly they can leave the city before someone comes asking questions, Dane drowns himself in ale then steps out back to have a few rounds in the tavern's fighting pits, punching away his problems to take his mind off what he just did. By the time the wagon is loading the last of its inventory, both Dane and the Dragonborn, who has finally managed to piece together exactly what just happened, express serious concerns over the events that just transpired, and propose to Zook that it might be best for them to part ways now. In response to this fear and reasonable request to go on their separate ways, 
Zook responds with what he feels to be an equally fair and reasonable alternative. They get back in line, or experience agony worse than those unfortunate enough to reside in the very bottom of hell. With that clearing things up for Dana and Adar, the party finds themselves on the road with two additional unassuming caravan guards already hired for the job, and they make their way north on the main road to the small central trading village called Green Tully. The poor wagon owner, who has yet to realise he's travelling with a full-blown psychopath and his equivalent of glorified meat shields, expresses concerns of Goliath bandit raids from the infamously vicious Daki tribe of the southern Tully Mountains. To his immense relief, however, only your typically stupid bandits stood in the path of their day-long trip. Yet before anyone else in the wagon could even reach for their weapons, Zook engulfed the outlaws in flames so hot they melted the meat clean off the bandits' bones as they screamed for mercy. And as they did so, the smile on Zook's face only grew. By the time they finally reached Green Tully by sunset, Zook had thankfully had his fill of murder for today, and decided not to push his luck fighting the far friendlier Goliaths from the peaceful Ironwell clan of the northern Tully Mountains that were happy to protect the locals in exchange for food and medicine. In his defence, the humble little general goods store didn't have much worth stealing anyway. Neither Dane nor Nadar slept much that night in the inn, and by morning no one was surprised to see that the other two caravan guards had happily ran away from the job in the middle of the night in order to get as far away as possible from the psychopathic arsonist. The wagon owner expressed his gratitude that Zook was on his side as they began making their way to Dale. However, his forced smile soon faded as Zook made mention of the renegotiation of payment he had planned once they arrived at their destination. By the time the party spotted another crowd of obstacles ahead of them in the distance, everyone else breathed a sigh of relief when Zook seemed more interested in searching the nearby forestry for something resembling a bear or monster to test the power of his staff upon. With the opportunity to avoid more excessive bloodshed that Dane had witnessed recently, he was happy to volunteer to go ahead on foot and figure out what was happening on the road. As the dwarf drew closer, he was pleasantly surprised to see not bandits, but a cluster of kobolds busy chatting amongst themselves. Known to the greater world as lovably stupid creatures with absolutely no sense of self-preservation, Dane greeted the kobolds and was informed by their leader, a kobold lucky enough to be born with the rare mutation of wings, that the sun was a sworn enemy, and they had all left the comfort of the darkness underground to rally themselves in their ultimate goal, to kill the sun. Knowing he just had to see how this was going to turn out, Dane happily stood back and merely encouraged them to go at it. Needing no further encouragement, the winged kobold leader cried out, CHARGE! and flew up, heading directly towards the sun in the sky, with his stone-crafted blade pointing his way. After one more distant battle cry from afar of, KILL THE SUN! The rest of the kobolds stood there confused on how to follow their great leader in his noble mission, with one or two of the brighter ones attempting a few jumps on the spot. They proceeded to watch as the winged kobold stared at the sun for too long, and blinded himself then proceeded to unceremoniously spiral out of the sky and fall to his death just down the road. In typical kobold fashion, the rest of the group seemed rather unconcerned about it. However, it did lead to the kobolds insisting Dane use his almighty strength to throw them at the sun in hopes of proving more successful. Though Dane did make the attempt to explain to them just the insurmountable depth to the flaws of their logic, they either weren't willing or... Far more likely, they weren't able to understand what could possibly go wrong with this idea. Not wanting to be attacked for taking the sun's side in this evidently long-lasting and well-founded rivalry, Dane reluctantly proceeded to toss the kobolds one by one in turn towards the sun, only for each one to obviously fall after a time and break their necks on impact. After the first accidental death, Dane had not been able to dissuade the others from trying as well, but when only one kobold was left to be thrown, and could not have been more excited about the prospect of going next, did Dane decide finally that enough was enough, and elected to bring the last remaining kobold along with him instead. 
Learning his name was Cain the Cobalb, the dwarf carried the cripplingly stupid creature back to hopefully live a better life with the party instead. Having nothing to show for his hunting expedition, save having his toe bitten by a small snake, the disgruntled Zook returned to the wagon. He hurried the wagon owner to get them to day already, thinking there laid access to all the riches and especially power that he sought with his new weapon of mass destruction. Yet, as the otherwise miserable party travelled with the unhinged tyrant to the city, none could have known what fate had in store for them. While Zook looked upon the distant city with anticipation, enjoying every second he believed himself to be the biggest fish in the sea, he was about to learn that he was swimming with sharks.